Wow, what a glorious morning. And once again, good morning to you. Uh, as Reverend Temple shared, my name is David Goldberg, and I have the joy and the honor for my ministry to be the publisher and editor of Science of Mind magazine, Guide for Spiritual Living. So, <clears throat> no, thank, thank you. Thank you for choosing to be here. What we know about our readers of the magazine, uh, we touch about 80,000 people uh, continuously on a monthly basis with our version of the Daily Word. We call them the Daily Guides. Uh, and of those 80,000 people that we touch every month, three out of four of them don't have this experience. The magazine is their spiritual community, and it's neither good nor bad, it simply is, and it's my joy and my honor to minister to those people in that way. And you give a minister a chance to have a microphone, now hold on. So it was such a joy to be with you. Uh, we started, uh, my husband Rick and I were here Wednesday night for an evening with the minister and the mystic. We had a great time. We played some beach music. We did some readings. We did some prayer. And we are just so grateful for the extraordinarily warm welcome uh, that you offered to us. Uh, and I also wanted to share with you, um, you know, Temple and I didn't even meet on this plane this time around in this life until last year. And it was just one of those moments for me that is, is truly a, a heart connection with the beloved. And I am so clear that we have been on this path together before, and it's an honor to be with you this time as well. So. <clears throat> So I know that you know, you know, you have the joy of being with Temple all of the time, and I just want to share, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I just want to share with you the, the foundation that you provide, the support that you provide her, the infrastructure that you provide her, allows her to show up on the national and the international stage in support of so many around the world. So uh, it, it, it's also my honor to serve with her. I'm one of the newest members of the Leadership Council for the Association of Global New Thought. And to be with Temple and Michael Beckwith and Roger Teal and so many wonderful people from all across the spectrum of progressive spirituality, it is an honor and you just need to know the work that you are doing here in support of this community, in support of Temple, is felt by people around the world, and thank you. <clears throat> you know, the, the first time we actually met, we had had some exchanges and some Facebook and some email. It was last year when you all were hosting the launch of the New Thought Channel, and I, I'm it just fills my heart with joy to still see the banners and know that Science of Mind magazine is with you all day, every day, and continues to be in your presence. Thank you for that. But the first time I walked through those doors, um, I was wearing a t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops, and Temple, as always, was in all of her sartorial splendor. She was doing her first interview for the New Thought Channel. Mitch Horowitz was here. The whole stage was set up as a TV studio. And here comes this country bumpkin from Colorado. The good news is that I made it. The interesting news is my luggage did not. <laughs> so here I come strolling in, and of course, Temple, absolutely no judgment, huge heart. David, I know you have many choices, and I just wanted to add one more to your list. You know, we have a great store, right? <clears throat> right here on our campus, right? And for those of us in any aspect of ministry, whether we're official or not, whatever we choose to call it, we help when we can. That is Temple's heart. She said, I just want you to know it's another choice for you. She said, you know, they don't happen to be open today, but I know a few people around here and I have a key. I said, okay. <clears throat> So there I am, and I have to tell you, thrift shopping had not been a part of my experience previously. <laughs> so my beloved is all about it. He, you know, a big day is going to the dollar store. And, and I'm trying to get there, I really am, and I love him and support him as he does me, and I'm still learning. So I, I walk into Encore, Temple turns on the lights for me, <clears throat> and I call Rick. And I say, you're not gonna believe this. He says, what? 
I said, I am having a Neiman Marcus personal shopper day (laughs) in a thrift store. He said, I love you, I love God, I love Temple even more. (laughs) So, you know, uh, part of what I picked up, because my luggage still didn't come, God bless United Airlines, they texted me every four hours to say they were working on it. And four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, 16 hours, now I'm being less than my spiritual self. 24 hours, we're still working on it. I'm like, nice, thank you, and clearly not hard enough. Um, Anyway, so we're getting ready for the the big launch. You've got the red carpet, all of the assembled guests, the love of all of this community. And I show up literally on the red carpet, outfitted from head to toe in my encore attire. (laughs) And I gotta say, I looked pretty good. (laughs) And I will also share with you that this shirt is still in my wardrobe. So So if you haven't had the opportunity, please do check it out. It's awesome. The other thing that I would share with you is I didn't get the note that Superhero Day is in two weeks when all of the young people are going to be showing up as their favorite superheroes. And I had the opportunity to meet uh, Reverend Richard and Chris this morning and another delightful dynamic duo. Thank you both for all you do. And Chris, bless his heart. I mean, talk about knowing how to dress. And I wasn't feeling any judgment. I wasn't feeling any judgment, but I kind of did feel... You know, the eyes were going up and down, and he kind of got, got stuck on my shoes. And I'm like, oh, dang, I'm busted. And of course, he would never say an unkind word, and I'm feeling, he noticed my gray socks with my blue pants. <laughs> but there's a method to my madness, because I thought today was superhero day, because these are my bat socks. <laughs> So today, we are talking about the hero's journey and the shero's journey. And if you don't remember anything else that I offer you today, please remember that just as you had friends and parents and mentors and extended family and religious community, so many people who loved you and continue to love you and support you, so too, you are that person for people in your life. That's not from a place of ego, that's not from a place of narcissism, that is simply from a place of knowing that that same God, that same spirit, that same power that created you continues to dwell in you and express through you. So when people are seeing you, we know this, they're not seeing you, they're seeing God. So all you need to do is get out of your own way and allow that to flow through you. So when Temple and I were talking about it after we uh, um, accepted her kind invitation and she said, well, David, you know, we want to get as many people here as we can. We want to promote you. What are you going to talk about? And I thought, okay, Temple, you've been at this a bit longer than I. You know what it's like asking a minister what they're going to talk about in six months. And she's like, yes, and my marketing people need something to be able to... Wrap, uh, wrap this around. I said, okay, so something that's percolating for me is the hero's journey. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And the shero's journey. And Rick and I had just gone to a meeting of a new group of shero's who also included men. And they had their pink capes. And they were awesome. And, and we were there for the inaugural meeting. So that was up for me. And so I told Temple, I want to talk about the hero's journey and the shero's journey. And she said, oh yeah, she said, that really resonates with my heart. I love the work of John Campbell and his interpretation of the hero's journey, being the erudite person that she is. And I was like, yeah, John Campbell, hero's journey, yeah. So I went and did my research to figure out what John Campbell had to say about the hero's journey. And it really is extraordinary work. He has outlined 17 points Uh, from his perspective as to what the hero's journey looks like. So sit back, relax, text your in-laws that you're going to be late for brunch as we explore 17 points of the hero's journey. (laughs) 
Some of you laugh, some of you are concerned. <laughs> I'm a minister, I'm not stupid, I won't keep you from lunch, I'm just kidding you. Um, so we also heard that the first service is, is a little more mellow, perhaps a little more meditative, and that you all are a little more, what is the word to use? A little more rambunctious? Um, a little more wound up, a little more coffee. So, you know what, like everything, we love it, we bless it, we call it all God. I would just ask, please don't throw anything that stains my nice shirt, okay? <laughs> so I would offer you uh, my take on the hero's journey. When I was in the eighth grade, I had the opportunity to go to a leadership camp for young people. And we went to the mountains and we had this amazing, this amazing week, uh, not unlike your young people were talking about in the first service, perhaps not as spiritually themed, but certainly all about the connection. And one of the mottos that I learned then that continues to serve me throughout, the, throughout my life is the phrase, what I can vividly imagine ardently desire, sincerely believe in, and enthusiastically act upon must eventually come to pass. Please repeat after me. What I can vividly imagine, ardently desire, sincerely believe in, and enthusiastically act upon must eventually come to pass. So isn't that our teaching in a nutshell? Isn't that extraordinary? We get to think about it, we get to call it in, we get to take action on it, and it has to happen, right? Because the universe is objective. We know that our thoughts are things. Whatever we put out there, we're going to receive. To use the overused analogy, but always appropriate, our mind is a garden and whatever we're planting is what we're going to reap. So if I plant tomatoes, the universe gives me tomatoes. If I plant petunias, the universe gives me petunias. It's not gonna say, oh, I think he was confused on Tuesday, he wants kumquats, <laughs> right? So whatever we put out, we're going to get. So let's unpack that just a little bit. What I can vividly imagine Oh my gosh, you know, Ernest Holmes is the founder of religious science, and I bring you greetings, as Temple said, from your cousins in religious science and centers for spiritual living, because like you, we are so clear that we are all one. So bless you and thank you for your, your warm welcome. So what I can vividly imagine, when I was a little guy, uh, my dad was a coach and my two older brothers were really, really good athletes. Me, not so much. I had other interests, but I gave it a shot. So we were, we were supposed to be practicing football and I was injured. So I was lying on the sideline and I'm just watching the clouds and, oh, that's an anteater. And that, that looks like cotton candy, you know, with all my football gear on and I'm just doing my, my sky watching thing. And I would invite you to consider when you had that moment, when you were lying on the grass, perhaps lying on the beach, looking at the clouds, what were you vividly imagining? You know, it makes me just a little bit sad when I hear people say, oh, I don't have an imagination or mm, I'm really not creative. That's something those people do. My friends, we are all creative because we are expressions of the divine. It can simply be no other way. Whatever you do, however you do it, you are creative and we are co-creating and imagining our lives together. So what do you vividly imagine? Hmm. So I was talking about Ernest Holmes and of course the founders of Unity, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, also extraordinary beings who brought so much to the planet. Um, you know, early in their lives, they were both diagnosed with tuberculosis. So they had physical challenges that they were working through along their path. Uh, and they both happened to have August birthdays. So Myrtle was born on August 6th. We celebrated her birthday last week. Charles's birthday is August 22nd, a birthday that he shares with Temple's beloved mother. 
So we bless all of those Leos and all of those cusp children and everybody born in the month of August where we in the States don't have a national holiday or even a card giving holiday. Our birthday gets to be the holiday, so we love that. So what I would offer about the Fillmores and the, in their diagnosis of tuberculosis is Myrtle came to prayer, came to religion, came to spirituality through Christian science as a way to help heal her of her physical challenges. And um, she credits that with indeed doing just that, with being healed of tuberculosis. Now, Myrtle was born nine years before Charles, with absolutely no disrespect intended, I would just offer that Myrtle was an original cougar. So, you know, bless her heart. She went after Charles and she got what she wanted. Uh, and the other thing that I appreciate about the Fillmores is their connection to my home state of Colorado. Charles actually lived in Colorado as a young man when he was single. And then he and Myrtle were married in Clinton, Missouri. And immediately after their wedding, they drove to Pueblo, Colorado, which is where they lived. And they had their first two sons. So on behalf of all Coloradans everywhere, uh, we bless the Fillmores and we're grateful for their energy in our state. But what the Fillmores did to the point of vivid imagination is because of their healing through prayer, through uh, the, the work that they were doing, through the spiritual work, they created a personal vision statement for themselves. And I am paraphrasing, it goes something like, because we are so blessed, because our physical bodies have been healed, we commit all we are our time, our talent, and treasure to furthering this teaching while we're on the planet. So my friends, you are here today because of the vivid imaginations of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. What are you vividly imagining? What are you calling in for your family, for your community, for your colleagues, for your friends, that future generations 150 years from now will be standing upon your shoulders. What are you vividly imagining? The second piece is ardently desire, what I could vividly imagine and ardently desire. What do you know? What do you just know at the core of your being? We, we all learn, we all release things that don't serve us, we all adopt and adapt new ideas. What is something that you just know? I would invite you to consider uh, the, the TV show, Dancing with the Stars. Any fans? At some point, maybe, I understand. I'm a little timid to admit that too. Um, I, I watched it a few years ago, and of the cast of stars, it's interesting how, how the definition of star shifts, but that, that's another talk. Um, so out of the stars, there was this young man whose stardom was attributed to his winning America's Next Top Model. I think he was one of the first guys to win that show. So really handsome guy, uh, also very smart. He got a degree in mathematics, so he was teaching math to young people. And it just so happened that he was totally deaf. And through a sign language interpreter, the reporter was asking him, how can you dance? How can you be on a show where you're supposed to dance where you can't hear the music? And he said, my partner is amazing. We have visual cues, we have touch cues, we watch each other closely, we watch all of the people around us. And she said, well, th that's, that's intriguing. And what is your motivation? And he said, I have to have the Mirrorball Trophy. If you're not familiar with the show, there's this glorious, gaudy, grand Mirrorball Trophy that the winners take home. So that, is, that was his motivation. He wanted the Mirrorball Trophy. Perhaps facetiously, perhaps tongue in cheek, and that was his motivation. What do you ardently desire? The third piece is Sincerely believe in. Do you, do you believe in yourself? I know that you believe in those around you and you believe in your family, but we know that we can't give what we don't have. So the invitation is to dig deep and to believe in yourself. 
Um, and what that looks like is, you know, I was sharing that this is the 90th anniversary of Guide for Spiritual Living Science and Mind magazine. We are one of the oldest continually published digest size magazine in the country, second only to Reader's Digest. Um, and so as we entered into our 90th anniversary year, we started off last October with Mother Teresa on the cover. And the reason we did that, it was very strategic. First of all, we honor wisdom wherever it lies, within all traditions, within all people, within all beings. Second, last August, I'm sorry, last October, Mother Teresa was beatified the first week in October, and she became Saint Teresa. So it was our opportunity to share with our readers her story. And what we know is uh, Mother Teresa got her calling when she was 14 years old. She was praying in the garden with her siblings, and she uh, immediately knew, she heard, yours is the work of God. Dedicate your life to God's work. And she did. So fast forward four years later, she's 19 years old. She's working in the slums of Calcutta with the poorest of the poor, with the lepers, with, with the outcasts, with people nobody wanted to touch or be with or see. And she was in pretty regular contact with the sisters from the convent. And she was young and she was energetic and she was very bright. And they said, we need you to come back to the convent. We need you to help manage and help run the convent. And so she had a crisis of faith. And as she always did, she took it to prayer. God, what is mine to do? What am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do? You know, to be clear, the convent was Spartan and very sparse, and she had a bed, she had running water, and she had meals, none of which was guaranteed in her work in the slums. And when she was in prayer again, God, what is mine to do? She got the exact same message. Yours is the work of God. Do God's work, which she interpreted as keep doing what you're doing. So she did. As many of us know from that, uh, the uh, ever-present and, and glorious Lord's Prayer, she surrendered, thy will be done. So, as we move forward to the end of her life then, there were 400 convents under the banner of the Sisters of Charity. The um, organization that she created, tens of thousands of women who entered um, the sisterhood entered in that particular order to do the work that Mother Teresa was called to do. So what do you sincerely believe in? What is it that you know at the core of your being? And then finally, enthusiastically act upon. You know, in religious science, and I'm sure you, you have something very similar, we say, treat and move your feet, which means it's great to pray and P.S., I get to help God out, I get to take action on it, right? I, I get to move into it as well. I bless my brothers and sisters who choose a monastic life and who are able to pray all of their waking hours all day long, and that is not my path. So while I love prayer and I spend a lot of time in prayer, I also choose action. And I invite you in, into that as well. And as a part of that, I would share with you the story of a young mother uh, as, as was so beautifully expressed by Katerina earlier today, uh, so many people find themselves in, in that situation. And so this particular mom had kids and she was working two jobs and three jobs and trying to make ends meet and trying to do what she knew how to do. And somehow it just wasn't enough. The, everything wasn't connecting and she wasn't feeling loved and supported. And she was at a birthday party for uh, the friends of her young children. And some of, her, some of her colleagues, some of her friends, some of the other parents were saying, you know, you're an amazing storyteller. Why don't you write something down and see what comes and see what happens? So she allowed somebody else to help her explore her magnificence. And she did. So she started writing something down. And she was feeling pretty good about it. And then she massaged it and shared it with a couple of friends. And uh, finally, she got it to a place where she thought it was good enough to share and to see if somebody would help her publish that. So she, she uh, put it in an envelope and sent it off to the publisher. 
And she was so proud and excited and so pleased and she was just waiting. And she waited and she waited. And then the day came, she got a letter from the publisher and she opened it up and it was a rejection letter. Thank you, we looked at what you had, it doesn't fit with what we do, good luck. Oh. Okay, well, let's try again. So she sends it off to another publisher. Waits a while, gets another letter. Sorry. Sends it off to two more publishers. Gets two more letters. Mm, Not a good fit for us. So now she's at about six rejection letters. She sends out three more manuscripts. Mm, No, mm, not gonna work, Mm, not our genre. Okay, I can do this. She sends out two more manuscripts. Mm -mm, Not the best fit for us, but you know, we wish you luck. Good luck with what you're doing. So, many of you are familiar with the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. One of the agreements is don't take anything personally. She poured her heart into this work. It's going to save her family. It's going to save everything that she's doing. And she's got 11 rejection letters. Hard not to take it personally, yeah? So, she's, she thinks she's got one more in her. So she puts it in an envelope, sends it off to a friend of a friend of a friend, willing to try anything at this point. And she's waiting and she's waiting and half expecting to get, you know, another thin envelope saying, no, thank you. And an envelope never comes, but a phone call does. And it is the the last publisher that she sent the book to saying, "We'd, we'd be willing to have a conversation with you. So they schedule an appointment two or three weeks out. You know, she's on pins and needles the whole time. And the day arrives and she puts on her best business attire and gets herself to the publishing office. She's sitting in the waiting room. And somebody comes in and says, welcome, and the publisher will see you now. So she's not meeting with an agent. She's not meeting with a manager. She's meeting with the publisher of the publishing company, who, by the way, happens to be the CEO. So it is this person's company. And he invites her into his office, and he's kind, and he offers her something to drink, and they're having a a conversation and making small talk. And he looks at the manuscript, and he looks at her, and he looks at the manuscript, and he looks at her again. And then he closes it, and he puts it on his desk, and he says, I'm really hesitant about this, but I think we might be willing to take a chance with you. He said, but there are going to be some conditions. So she's like, oh, goodness, you know, what do the conditions look like and feel like? He said, so here's what we know about being in the publishing business for so long. You wrote a book for kids. You know, kids don't read. Of course, their parents have to buy the books and read, read them to them. And in this day, with e-books and everything else, the sales of children's books are the first ones that are going down here. You read, I know it, and you are welcome. You stay with us. <laughs> so you're publishing children's books, and, you know, that's strike one. Number two, you've not only written a children's book, but you've written a children's book for boys. Boys don't read. I was one. So, you know, two strikes. Number three, you not only wrote fiction for children, for boys, but you're a woman. And woman, women you know, just really haven't made it big in this arena. So we're, we're willing to consider this, we're willing to move forward, but I really seriously encourage you to keep your day job. You're gonna have to do something to pay the bills. And he said, now the toughest one might be, the last change that I need you to make is you can't use your your name. We can't have people knowing right off the bat that you're a woman. So Joanne, I need you to use the initial of J. And if you want to pick another initial, please do. And she couldn't think of anything and it just flew out of her mouth and she said K. And he said, okay, J.K. Rowling, we will publish your book. So what is it, and this is 20 years later that we're celebrating the first anniversary of the first, the 20th anniversary of the Harry Potter series. 
Talk about changing the world through your action. She could have been sidelined with the first letter or the seventh letter or the twelfth letter, and she said, no, this is mine to do and I can take action on this. So my friends, what is the action that you are vividly imagining that you can take action on today? What do you need to do today to move your dream forward? Do you need to make that call, send that email, write that letter, communicate with that friend, forgive a family member, uh, reach out for help, reach out to help someone else? One step before you leave today, get clear about one step that you can do to move your dream forward. What I can vividly imagine, ardently desire, sincerely believe in, and enthusiastically act upon must eventually come to pass. Please join me in prayer. So I am so clear that the only thing present is that which I choose to call God, but that goes by so many names. Jesus, Buddha, Spirit, Mohammed, Yahweh, Dr. Seuss, Mother Teresa. I say yes, because what I know is that one power, that one presence is in, around, and through everything and everyone. Sentient beings, animate and inanimate, it is all good because it is all God. And what I call in for every being here, for every being that can hear my voice is the highest and best in every aspect of their lives. Mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, professional. Again, it is all good because it is all God. Regardless of what it looks like through our human eyes, I say this or something better on behalf of every one of these beloveds. And as we go forward, I know that we live the concept of namaste, that the divinity in me blesses and recognizes the divinity in you. And as every one of these beloveds is looked to as a shiro, is looked to as a hero, I know that they humbly say yes to the call because they are God expressing. They are sheroes, they are heroes, not only in their own lives, but to their families, to their friends, their communities, to their entire circles and spheres of influence. Again, not from a place of narcissism, not from a place of being better than, simply from a place of the one power, the one presence, the one being who created me is all of me, and I simply allow that to flow through me. I get out of my own way, I tap into the wisdom of the universe, and I say, thank you, God, please use me. So we go forth. We are empowered, we are overjoyed, we are superheroes, knowing that every action, reaction, interaction, and transaction is God speaking to God. I simply let it be. I let God be God. I let us be our highest and best, knowing all is well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Spirit. And so it is. Amen.